Hi, welcome to episode 15 of the Gentle Knitter podcast. My name is Nicole and I'm coming to you from Ottawa, Ontario. Today is a beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's April 23rd and I'm so glad to join you again today. I've missed talking to you. It's been several weeks since I last recorded. I have a lot to talk about today. I have a lot to show you. Last episode was a little bit of a long one and it was mostly me talking. I was answering questions from my Ask Me Anything thread and um, I think um, I, I kind of got the sense, I got a little bit of feedback that maybe it was a little too long and a little bit um, too chatty and not not enough showing. So today I'm, I've come very prepared to show you lots of good things. So why don't I just jump on in? Um, first of all, I wanted to talk about a Cal, a knit along that I've been hosting. Um, it is a Cal that features a hat that was a, an incentive for a crowdfunded project the project is called Woods Making Stories, and it is a book that's being published by Verena Kors and Hannah Lisa Haferkamp. They are both uh, they're both in Berlin, and they are uh, they have uh, put together this beautiful project. It's a book of patterns, and also uh, will have interviews with different designers and yarn dyers. Um, and the book is meant to showcase European um, smaller batch and hand-dyed, hand-made natural yarns. And uh, so, and the aesthetic of the project is very much the kind of thing that I like, very naturalistic, uh, slightly minimalist, um, just really clean, beautiful, uh, slightly romantic design. And uh, the pattern that they had, they were giving out for those who donated to their crowdfunding project is called the Pico de Europa hat. And so I decided to uh, host a knit along for that hat. And um, so I talked about it uh, last time and maybe the time before. Um, I've been hosting this knit along. It's on until May 1st. So if you have the pattern and you have not yet joined the Cal, it is not too late. <laughs> There's still one more week. And um, I can tell you that I, it will, it'll definitely be worth your while entering if you do want to knit that hat, because um, I'm going to have a really beautiful prize package for the uh, the finished object ca um, thread, but also for the chatter thread, I will also have a prize. So I don't have those here to talk about today. But next episode, I will definitely show you all of those goodies. I know um, I'm teasing you a little bit with that, but I promise you it will definitely be um, be worth it. So, like I said, if you are interested in knitting the Pico de Europa hat and you have the pattern, please join us. Uh, it's not too late. I actually knit knit a hat, and I'm thinking I might try and cast on for another one and just kind of slip it under the wire. Although, you know, obviously I, um, I'm not entering the, <laughs> the giveaway, but, um, but I'll show you, uh, the hat that I knit. Um, here it is. And, uh, it turned out beautifully. It is, uh, so again, the Pico de Europa hat. It's a beautiful hat that features kind of a leafy cable motif that goes up uh, and with a reverse stockingette um, background. And I always really like that. I like cables that are against uh, a, stock, a reverse stockingette background. The other thing I really like about the hat is that the, um, the um, uh, brim is uh, knitted in twisted stitches. Well, actually, all of the knit stitches are twisted in this hat, but uh, it just really, really defines, especially this beautiful kind of uh, chevron detail. And I love the fact, too, that the um, the ribbing continues into the pattern. I, I love that kind of detail. I find that it just uh, creates a design that is so harmonious, that really flows, and... Um, 
it's a really beautiful hat. It's um, a lot of people, a lot of knitters that have uh, made it have found it runs a little bit small and I definitely agree. I did an extra repeat to make it a little bit taller. Uh, I do have a big head so I often have to modify patterns, uh, hat patterns to fit me. But, um, but if I were to do it again, it calls for DK weight yarn. I might, uh, I think I would probably go for a true worsted or maybe even Aran. Um, but that's also because I like to have more of a slouchier hat. And uh, I might see if I can um, get my hands on some Let Lopi. I'm thinking a version in Let Lopi would be really pretty. I know that yarn is a bit fuzzy and it might obscure a little bit the uh, the cables, but because they are twisted stitches, I, I think it would still, um, you would still see the pattern. And I, I do find that quite pretty when, uh, when you see cables in a slightly fuzzy yarn and it kind of softens and blurs the lines. Um, for me, it, it's, I enjoy that. I think it, it has, it's a pretty effect. So so I might do that. We'll see if I have time. I have, as you'll see, I have tons of projects on the go. So I'm probably living in dreamland thinking I could uh, pull another one out. Although it is a fast knit and it's a really engaging knit. So you kind of, you want to keep going. It's not difficult and uh, you sort of quickly, I quickly kind of memorized it and was able to just uh, knit on it, work on it without referring to the pattern. Um, so as I said, it was a knit long and it was really wonderful. I'm talking about it in past tense. It's not over yet, uh, but so far we've had lots of activity, some really, really beautiful finished objects. So I encourage you, even if you're not participating in participating in the Cal to uh, go over to the finished objects thread to see all of the other projects. Um, we had several people knit the hat in uh, natural dyed yarn, so some really beautiful results there. And in fact, there's been a lot of chatter in the chatter thread about uh, natural dyeing and, and people wanting to, to experiment. I think at this time of year with the spring and everything coming up, it's um, it, it sort of uh, makes sense that people have, have natural dyeing on the brain and I certainly am looking forward to maybe having my own little natural dye experiments this summer. But, um, but yeah, the chatter thread has been wonderful, super encouraging. Everybody has just been really active and really supportive and, and very responsive in terms of um, answering each other's questions. And um, yeah, it's been really fun. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I did get some feedback too from, a, uh, from somebody that um, they were a little um a little sad that I had chosen a pattern that was not available to the wide public it was only available to people who had um who had funded uh the um the the project and uh, you know I really appreciate that comment and um, my intention is certainly to have more knit alongs and next time I will choose a free pattern so that way you know everybody can participate and uh, I think this was a really good one to start off. It was maybe smaller than, than if I had chosen a free pattern. And so it was good for me to kind of dip my toe into the uh, knit along world. I'm not the most organized uh, person and it, it's hard for me to sort of spend a lot of time online, but, uh, but I, I did try my best to, to be uh, present and active in the forums and it was really, I, I really enjoyed it. So anyway, so that's that. Um, I haven't uh, yet, I don't have the, uh, the, the, um, what am I trying to say? Sorry, I <laughs> don't have the prizes yet. Um, I have, I know what I want to pick out from my stash, but I'm still waiting for some swag from Verena and uh, Hannah Lisa. So uh, once I have all that, I will put it all together and I will draw for a prize. I will close the thread May 1st and I will draw for a prize next time I record. So 
All right, well, that's it for the uh, knit along. And actually, that is the only finished object that I have. I have a lot of uh, works in progress. Uh, maybe I will start with some spinning because I've been doing a ton of spinning lately, uh, mostly spindle spinning. Um, and uh, I've been keeping my my yarn and my fleece in my beautiful uh, Laura Shepherd bowl, which I've shown before. I, for some reason, I, I just really enjoy keeping my spindle and my fiber in there. Right now, it's actually just filled with finished um, yarn. Um, well, semi-finished, only because I can't find my Nitty Naughty. It's somewhere in the house. So I haven't yet skeined up the yarn, which means that I have not yet, um, I haven't soaked it yet. So this is on, um, it's not finished yarn, but it is, it has been spun and plied. The first uh, yarn that I wanted to show you is yarn that I made um, from fiber that I had prepared with my blending board, which I showed you two episodes ago. Um, I don't have it here with me, but it is, uh, for those who didn't see the episode or don't know what a blending board is, it's a, uh, it's a wooden board that has, um, a mat on it with, uh, teeth and you can basically lay down fiber on this board and then you have dowels that allow you to, to pick up the fiber and roll it into, uh, Rolags and Rolags are just a, a way of preparing fiber for spinning. So it's basically fiber that's kind of been rolled in a in a tube, and then when you spin, you, you kind of spin from the end of the tube, and um, it creates yarn that is fairly fluffy. And um, you can also, because it's a board and it's kind of a, a rectangle, you can you can create um, different kind of uh, gradations of color or mix a bunch of different fibers together and so this yarn was made with some um, some fiber that was kind of a dark teal and then fiber that was just natural white and I combed it together to create this sort of very pale blue it's being blown out of course it's a little warmer than what you're seeing um, you're seeing a very whitish white, but it's it's more of a creamy white, and then the the blue is is a warmer, almost kind of a robin's egg blue. But I really I really like it. I think it's very pretty. I don't have a lot. I was basically just playing with uh, with the blending board and just kind of um, figuring out how it works, and so I didn't prepare a ton of fiber. I have more, so I I could. Uh, spin more, but I might just end up I'm not sure how many uh, meters I have. I don't know what I'm going to make with this, but I probably would have enough for maybe some like fingerless gloves or something. It's very soft. Um, yeah, so anyway, so there's that. And then I finished uh, spinning uh, some fiber that I talked about a bunch of times. It is fiber that I uh, spun. I've talked a lot about my moussey. Um, just ignore this fiber here. This is uh, another kind of random test that I was doing. But my moussey is a spindle that is made with uh, moose antler. So the top, the, the whorl of the spindle is made with uh, moose antler. Moose uh, drop their antlers and so it's collected. They're not killed to make the spindle. And I believe the wood is ebony. It's a really beautiful spindle. It uh, was made by, uh, uh, Bo it's a Bosworth spindle. Bit expensive, but it spins so beautifully. I, I love this spindle. It's my favorite one. I have three and um, definitely this one is the one I prefer by far. It's, it's small, but it, it spins really just beautifully. Anyway, I spun this yarn that um, is from a fiber that it is very, very rustic and it is very scratchy actually. But it's got Icelandic, it's got Shetland, it's got hemp. Um, I'm trying to remember if there's anything else. I will put the information down there. I, I, I should have it with me. I've talked about this fiber a lot so I 
thought I, <laughs> I, w I was trying to rely on my memory there, but I can't remember. It's something like the Spinner's Biota, um, but I can't remember who the, I bought it on Etsy. Anyway, you have the information down there. It's a really nice, uh, nice blend of grays. I find it very pretty. And uh, I think I probably have enough to make a pair of socks and I think it would make a very nice hard wearing pair of socks and because it's not super soft I think it, it's probably appropriate for for socks but anyway it's very nice it's very fine I tend to spin very fine naturally that's sort of when I'm spinning that's just kind of what my hands want to do and uh, I'm actually working on making um, I'm trying to make thicker yarns because just just so I can do both so I'm not just automatically always churning out like super super fine yarn but for socks it would be quite appropriate so so yeah I really enjoy that it smells very good and then the last thing that I did was a little bit of a little more playing with my uh, with my blending board and I had mentioned when I uh, talked about the blending board that I, what I was really interested in doing is perhaps doing some blends of neutral fibers with some more colorful um, fiber. And so I did a little bit of playing and uh, let me just show you what I used. So I used some of this really beautiful pole, pole worth. Uh, again, the maker escapes me I'll put it down there but it's very soft it's kind of a, a camel like a, a, a sort of soft beige color and I blended it with something that you will <laughs> you know I know uh, I've known for my very neutral color choices and and uh, this is definitely outside my comfort zone but I blended it with this stuff here, which, you know, has some bright purple and some orange and neon pink and kind of a very, like, almost like popsicle blue. Um, this is some um, Falkland, and uh, it's by Neighborhood Fiber Company. They're actually, I believe, local to me, and I bought it at my my LYS, my local yarn store called Wabi Sabi. And um, they have a lot of really lovely fiber. It's always very, very bright like this. And um, like I said, I, I'm more attracted to calmer, softer, uh, quieter colors. So I thought, well, let's let's see what happens when you blend um, some something crazy like this with something kind of boring like this. I am so thrilled with the results. This is just a teeny tiny little mini skein, but um, so you get this really beautiful mix, a very soft mix of the beige with like some very pale lavender and just a bit of the peachy orange. Um, let's see if I undo this so you can see it. This I tried to spin a bit thicker and uh, you can probably see that it ended up being uh, plumper, definitely. It's uneven, but that's okay. I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still learning to, uh, to do thicker yarn. And I actually really like that kind of thick and thin effect from hand spun. So I really don't mind. But anyway, I love the results. I'm really excited to, uh, to keep uh, experimenting. I have some really, uh, another bag of crazy fiber that I pulled out. This was something, sorry for the crinkling. Something that I got, um, I ordered some fiber from, um, let's see, it doesn't say what the company is. There's the label here, just says that it's an art bat. Um, oh, the company's on the other side, but I won't open the bag. Anyway, I've got some super crazy, um, there's even some Stellina in here. But uh, I thought, what am I going to do with this? It's really beautiful. I thought maybe... Uh, you know, just give it away or 
But now I'm thinking, you know, mix this with some gray or some charcoal. I think, you know, if you, so what I was doing is, uh, is on my blending board, I was laying down a very, very thin uh, layer of the, the neutral yarn. And then I broke up the colored yarn in the different colors and then just kind of put very, very uh, small little bits of this, uh, the, the really bright yarn. Then I'd cover it again with uh, a, a thin layer of the neutral and just kind of like build up uh, these layers and um, ended up with, with, um, with fiber that really kind of reads, I think from afar, will read as a neutral, but then when you see it up close, you can see that there's some really pretty pops of color that um, that you, you're only gonna see when, when you see the fabric up close. And that's a quality that I, I love in a lot of things. You see it a lot in, in like Harris Tweed fabrics. I have a, a beautiful coat that is, uh, is Harris Tweed. And from afar, you know, you would swear it was gray. And then up close, it's got red and blue and green and, and white and all kinds of colors. It's like really, really multicolored, but from afar it, it, it does read gray. So I like that. I like that effect. A lot of, um, a lot of yarns that I like are, are like that, have that quality, like um, Shetland yarns and any of the, the Tweety yarns generally have, have that going. Um, so anyway, super happy with my little experiment and I'm definitely going to be uh, doing more of that. So next up, I thought I would talk about a book that I bought. I'm, I'm only going to talk about it very briefly because it probably has some limited interest um, for, uh, for many viewers uh, only because, well, first of all, it's in French. And second of all, it is a book that is about a magazine that was around in the 70s and the 80s called Sans Idées. So that translates to 100 Ideas. And it was a crafting magazine that came out uh, in 1972. And so for those of you who were around in those times, it was a very, um, there was a, a, a big movement of people kind of getting back to the earth and doing things yourself and and uh, making things crafting um, a lot of like kind of natural materials and uh, alongside with all of the <laughs> the super synthetic uh, and you know plasticky things that that started becoming really very popular and very common in the marketplace but there was a kind of a not a backlash but just sort of a um another another um another trend if you will um uh, you know and when i think of the 70s those are the things that i think about i think about you know macrame and dried flowers and and pottery and and very, you know, like uh, rustic interiors, lots of wood, ceramic, that kind of thing. So, uh, and I remember as a kid that um, my mom had a friend who, her house was very much like that. And she had these magazines, uh, these Santidé magazines from, uh, from France. And um, I loved going through them. I really did. And... I found out that they were putting out a book that basically is sort of um, a gathering of of a bunch of the content from from the magazine, specifically in the 70s. So the magazine was also uh, being published in the 80s and maybe even the early 90s. But um, but the uh, they decided to put up a, to put a collection together of. Uh, a lot of the stuff that came out in the 70s and I'm very nostalgic. I was born in 1970 and so I'm very nostalgic for that time and a lot of my aesthetic kind of is is very much that kind of granola 70s aesthetic. So anyway, I bought the book and it's really wonderful. It's got a lot of, uh, you know, it talks a lot about not just 
the magazine and showing some of the projects that were in the magazine, but also um, how they put the magazine together. It was very much um, a group effort that, you know, like the models in the, the shots are all like family members of the editorial staff and, and uh, you know, they took pictures at people, friends' farms and that kind of thing. So anyway, it, it's got a lot of really fun anecdotes. And I wanted to show you, there's some really like very, very colorful stuff. Uh, let me see, you know, there's like some very bohemian, crazy, almost, almost a cave facet type of stuff. And then there's like children's clothing that are really very, very bright. Um, but there's a lot of really beautiful, uh, kind of natural there's a lot of a lot of knitting in this book and uh, and there's there's quite a few patterns knitting patterns and uh, a lot of folkloric stuff too which I love and then there's one section called retour à la terre which means uh, back to the earth so it, it that chapter is really about all that aesthetic that I am very very fond of and so there's um there's this sweater here which has the pattern and it's it's very beautiful. It's made in super duper bulky yarn, so I'm not sure if I would knit it. Maybe. There's also a pattern for this gorgeous blanket. Um, okay, sorry, I'm moving a lot and the sun is probably making it a bit hard to see, but basically. Um, those the people in the photo are actually were a. Um, were vendors, yarn vendors in the Pyrenees uh, region of France. And so they, it features their, the yarn that they actually produce, which was kind of like very, very rustic natural yarn. And um, there's uh, the pattern for this blanket. And I just, I, I love this photo. I love the people in it. I love the blanket. I love the beautiful rustic yarn. Um, oh, anyway, <laughs> this is really, really me. There's also this blanket, which is really gorgeous. It's like, um, it's a chevron pattern. And of course, you know, the photo of the kids on the hayloft. It's very kind of idealized, um, kind of view of that rural life. But, um, there's this one other garment that I am crazy about and it is this crazy bulky dress sweater <laughs> I'm not quite sure you know it, it it's just a big garter tunic I guess but I really I love it oh I would just I mean it would look probably really horrible on me but I just imagine making it so that I can hang out you know when it's really cold just put that on and just be so so cozy and I, I just love you know the fact that you know these are the photos that that were in the magazine so these are clearly 70s people very um, lots of hair lots of mustaches um, there's this gorgeous um, spread here the guy with the little lamb and I just yeah this really brought me back um, this sweater here too is really beautiful. Very, just very basic kind of rustic cardigan. These crazy, like kind of uh, shepherd vests. Anyway, I uh, I was really happy to to get my hands on on this book, and just thought I would mention it really quickly. It's um, it just sometimes it's fun to look at. Um, to look at old crafting books. I actually collect a lot of uh, 70s craft books when I see them at um, at the um, um, like at a charity shop or whatever. They often have really beautiful patterns, uh, really lovely things. So so yeah, I was uh, I was excited. Oh, there's also I really love this sweater. Oh my god, and I love what she's wearing. It's so beautiful. Yeah, I when I see this, I really see a lot of of my aesthetic now, and that's quite quite interesting. Anyway, so sans idée and uh, l'aventure des 70s, so the 70s adventure. 
So my next, uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is something that I've shown to you many times before. It is my quill from Jared Flood, and I finally finished the center square. So for you, those of you who don't know, uh, a hap shawl is um, it's kind of a traditional um, style of shawl from Shetland. And generally how they're made is that you knit a center square and then you pick up the stitches around that square and then you knit a lace border, you knit out. So I finally, finally finished the gigantic middle square. Here it is, I've, I've picked up the stitches around the square. So, so you end up with this kind of like bag. And actually I was watching um, the latest episode of Camembonia podcast. And uh, if you don't know that podcast, I know I've talked about it before, but you absolutely must, must check it out. It's done by Pia and her husband, Dennis. And um, they're, they're wonderful. Every time I watch their podcast, I am just so inspired and uplifted. And um, it just, I don't know, they, you know, first of all, Pia is an incredible uh, knitter very, very talented. She also designed, she's designed several beautiful patterns that I have and have not yet cast on for, but I'm dying to. Um, and uh, she's so thoughtful and so lovely and full of life. And then her husband, Dennis, is an, an absolute joy. He is really funny. He's always teasing uh, Pia, but he also uh, is often, you know, stealing a kiss um, or just snuggling her hand. He, he is incredibly loving and um, it's really lovely to see the both of them talk about, you know, talk about knitting, but also talk about books and, and just uh, having lovely cozy moments together. And Dennis just learned how to knit too. And so now he has been really doing so well. He's knit uh, a cowl with a like a Gansey pattern. That was his first project, which is crazy. Uh, he's knit himself a hat. He's knit himself some mittens. I mean, he's really, really doing incredibly well. Uh, of course, he has uh, an awesome teacher. But anyway, all that to say that um, right now, Pia is knitting a hap of her own. She is knitting the Hansel hap by Gudrun Johnston. And uh, so she's kind of, uh, she's further along than I am. She's got her square done and then she's got a good section of the lace done. But she was holding it up and Dennis said, oh, you know, I was teasing you that I, th I thought you were knitting um, panties because <laughs> he felt like it kind of looked like almost like underwear. Um, and then Pia's like, well, how big do you think my, my bum is? <laughs> but anyway, that made me laugh. But it is kind of like a big, a big pouch, uh, just because the uh, the sides of the square are all gathered up. But anyway, I'm just so happy that I finished the center square. It just felt like it took forever, but it's all done, and now I've I'm ready to start knitting the lace border, which is also a fair amount of knitting. So my feeling is that I probably won't get this done till till the fall, but that's fine because it is a big blanket of a, a shawl and, um, you know, it's not, not something I'm going to need to wear anytime soon. I'm knitting it in this cone of Briggs and Little yarn. It is uh, not a yarn that is really available commercially. I bought it at a warehouse sale, but it is very similar to their, um, they've got a sport weight and this is a little bit finer, but it, you could definitely substitute, um, you know, for the, uh, their sport weight for, for this, but it was dirt cheap. I think I paid $15 for, um, I mean, I've knit all of this and the cone, I mean, I've barely <laughs> made a dent. So I've got several of these cones. It was such a good deal. So I've got that. And then I have something else that is completely, um, it's insanity. This project is crazy. Um, I've talked a little bit about 
the fact that I really love natural yarns and I try and that that's kind of what I favor. I like uh, non-superwash yarns that are a little bit more rustic but I do have quite a lot of superwash in my stash. Stuff that I bought sort of you know um, for the first you know 15 years of my uh, of my knitting life if you will and um, and it's beautiful and it's a shame to have it and not use it because it has already been produced and so you know the the problems that I have with superwash are basically that you know there's some harsh chemical treatments that need to happen in order to make superwash either that or mechanical treatments but it's very uh, resource intensive it, it requires a lot of um, a lot of processing and so to me it kind of denatures the yarn a little bit and and removes some of the some of the the qualities that I really love about wool and you know it's not as um, it's not as green if you will it's it's kind of more uh, resource uh, intensive but as I said I do have a lot of it in my stash and I did contemplate just getting rid of it just kind of giving it away donating it but a lot of these yarns I hold memories because it's a lot of it is yarn that I bought on trips um, or yarn that was gifted to me and um, and so, you know, there's a lot of really lovely memories in this yarn. So I thought, well, maybe I could use it to make something that really does benefit from the fact that it is super wash and that it can be uh, thrown into the washer and dryer. So I decided um, that I would make a cozy memories blanket. But uh, I, this is the, the kind of the insanity part is that I, I thought, you know, I really like the pattern. I, a lot of knitters are making that blanket. It's, it's a really lovely way to use up scrap yarn. But I, um, I don't know, I, I've been looking on Pinterest. I've been looking a lot at like quilts and, um, you know, just different, different patchwork, uh, uh, works. And one thing that, I, I'm really drawn to our, our very small uh, motifs and very small pieces. So I decided to make a, what I'm calling a mini memories blanket. The blanket itself will not be mini, but my squares are. And so this is, I guess, the crazy part is that it's going to be just a lot of very, very tiny squares. Um, I'm so I just started it <laughs> and um, basically I just gathered a bunch of, of these yarns that I have that are um, that are pale and I, I kind of like this mix of just kind of almost like sun bleached colors. So I wanted to make a blanket, you know, a blanket is, is it's nice that it's washable because you can throw it in the washer if it gets uh, if it gets a little dirty or grimy or dusty. So uh, yeah, so here's my, the beginnings of my mini memories blanket. And I think it's going to be really, I'm very excited to put on a second row because I, I really want to see that effect of all the tiny little squares. I, I don't know, there's something really charming about the squares being really small. <laughs> um, of course, that means a lot more ends to darn in. And so I made myself a solemn promise that I would darn as I go. So that's what I've been doing. Um, this is the wrong side and I've just been basically, you know, just doing a very quick little darn every time I finish a square. I will probably end up putting a border uh, around the edge because it does kind of scallop a little bit and I think having like a nice even border maybe in in gray or cream or something to kind of unify the whole thing I think would be really very pretty. So you're gonna see this growing and growing and growing over the next many many months 
I, like I said, I pulled out stuff in my stash. I have probably a lot more in my stash that I can that I can use. I didn't go through the whole stash, but I, I just quickly um, dove in and um, I've got a lot of speckled koi goo. Um, for, for years I was going crazy and buying up all the speckled koi goo that I could find. So I've got a lot of stuff like this, which um, is become very popular now. Um, I've got another one here that's, uh, kind of got those little blue speckles um, but you know like 10-15 years ago Koi Gu were really the only company that were doing speckle dyes and I, I love them so much so anyway so there you go my mini memories blanket um, if anybody is interested in uh, the details of how I'm making these uh, I can tell you quickly, <clears throat> excuse me, my squares are, um, they're 23 stitches. And, and what I'm doing is I am doing the method where you do uh, like a triple decrease in the middle. So you get this, uh, this really nice defined line uh, throughout the center of the square. And uh, the way I'm doing it is that I'm slipping uh, two knitwise, knitting one, and then passing those two slip stitches over the knit stitch. Uh, so, so with 23 stitches, it means that I have like 10 stitches at, at the widest point. I have 10 stitches on either side of that three stitch decrease in the middle, and that's how I'm doing it. So, 23 stitches. I um, I always. Uh, knit that middle stitch on the wrong side. So it is garter, so you're, sorry, I said that wrong. I'm purling the middle stitch on the wrong side. So all of the other stitches are knit, but then the middle one is purled so that it oh, it's always um, stockinette stitch on this side. I hope that's clear, probably not. Just <laughs> leave me a message if you wanna know more. But anyway, I'm excited to show you more of that. And I, I love, love, love the way it looks so far. So I'm excited. Um, I'm glad that I have found something to do with that yarn because, yeah, because it's really pretty. I feel bad that, I would feel bad if I if I weren't to use it. So, so there you go. Lastly, I would like to announce the winner for episode 13's giveaway. And uh, it's, uh, it was a giveaway prompted by a beautiful, um, generous donation to the podcast by Freehand Fiber. Joyce sent me some gorgeous yarn uh, and uh, some other goodies to give away on the podcast. So I had a prompt um, asking you to tell me what it is you were looking forward to uh, this spring. And I got so many wonderful answers. It was really fun to read through them. I always find... Um, those kinds of prompts really, um, it, it, people's answers are really inspiring and, and really lovely to read. So uh, the winner will get this gorgeous uh, project bag with a beautiful hand-drawn botanical uh, illustration. And then inside is, uh, first of all, a, a beautiful notebook that was uh, hand-made uh, by Joyce from Freehand Fibers. And uh, so that's gonna be going to the winner. And then the, the main prize is this absolutely stunning skein of yarn. Beautiful, beautiful yarn. It's a fingering weight, uh, 436 yards, and it was naturally dyed with uh, Punctelia rudecta lichen. And uh, it's a really, it's just the perfect yarn, um, the perfect color for, for this time of year. And uh, so I drew a winner. And uh, so I'm going to pull that up here. The winner is, um, it was post 201, and that is Lovey Lamb. And uh, Lovey Lamb, her name is Julie. So Julie, congratulations, you are the winner. Uh, Julie is from Asbury Park or Ashbury Park, New Jersey. And uh, so please uh, get in touch with me and I will 
put those into the mail for you. Um, I hope you really enjoy this uh, this beautiful prize from uh, Freehand Fibers. And thank you again, Joyce, for your very generous uh, donation to the podcast. She also gave me some gorgeous Icelandic yarn, and I actually ordered more from her. Uh, I don't have it here, but when I am, um, eventually I, I want to make a shawl, kind of like an Icelandic style shawl. And uh, so I will show you that next time uh, when when I cast on with it. But um, I just checked her shop and she has a lot of really beautiful things in there. So I highly encourage you uh, to go check her, uh, her shop out. Some very beautiful uh, hand dyed, natural dyed yarn. So I believe that is it for me for today. It is boiling in here. The sun is really, uh, really coming in. And uh, so I'm going to uh, say goodbye for now. And um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And I look forward to catching up with you again in a couple of weeks. All right, be well. Bye.